was signed by George Washington. The man on the one dollar. Hello. Welcome to our copyright presentation, Teaching Old Dogs New Clicks. As you can see, our friend on the left is busy at work. My name is Bob Diotalevi, and I'm Hello, everybody. Uh, you're Gulf hearing Coast that. University Bob just Myers, can't Florida. stop talking. Copyright but, laws uh, again let me see if on I can the forefront get of education in cyberspace. For a second. I think I just did. All right. So welcome. Welcome to... Well, folks, it's been my pleasure to give you this presentation. I hope you did learn a little bit of uh, uh, information on copyright and our laws that apply there, too. There's my information. I'm from Florida Gulf Coast University, a great place to work, great place to be. If you ever come down, come and visit me. My email address is right there. It looks like Bob Diotalevi, but my name is so long you cut the VI off. Okay, so it's B D I O T A L E at fgcu.edu. Drop me a line if you like this presentation. Great, go online, go on the World Wide Web and find some of my articles, and hopefully that'll help you there. The scales of justice are there to remind you: do not steal it, and make sure, above all things, have a great time teaching. Stay honest and copy it right. All right, so that. Take care. Thank you. I can't, I can't stop this, but uh, let me just uh, share with you um, the PowerPoint presentation that you're going to listen to before Bob comes in. Now, this is, uh, I think, Bob's maybe fourth or maybe fifth year. Uh, he comes back every year to share everything that he knows about copyrights, which is really, really important. So this is Nellie, Janet. As you can recognize, it's not Bob yet. I'm going to start the uh, the PowerPoint presentation, and then afterwards, Bob's going to come in and he's going to quiz you on it. And it's a lot of fun if you've done this before. I'm, I've done it for five years, I think, or four years, and I still have so much to learn. All right. So if you could just add in the chat box where you're from, to, so that we can get a sense of uh, who's here and where you are and how you're doing and so on. Okay, so we've got Haley from uh, Delaware. Where is Delaware? We've got Poland. Awesome. And as you're doing that, I'm going to try to get something up here. Uh, send it. Okay, so on our tour of the world, we are now in the United States. Okay, that's where Bob is. Bob is from Florida, at least that's where he teaches. We've got Raymond from Dominica studying in Serbia. And we've got, uh, let's see, so uh, anybody else here? We've got Virginia, is that correct? VA is Virginia. Sorry, I'm Canadian, so I, I did study geography in every state, but I still get confused with the um, short forms. Ecuador, excellent. And where you are feel free to ask questions as we go all right and then uh, Bob will come back and answer all your questions all right so are we ready to get started okay are we ready so if you want to see what Bob looks like just uh, for the sake of uh, seeing who's going to appear here uh, okay so Bob is in twice okay there's Bob and there's Bob, okay, because he's in twice. He's once in with his PowerPoint presentation, and then he's going to come in. Hopefully, his webcam will work today, so we'll get a chance to see him. So here goes. Are you ready? Okay, so I'm going to start. Hello. Can you hear? Welcome to our copyright presentation. Listen carefully. Teaching old dogs new clicks. As you can see, our friend on the left is busy at work. My name is Bob Diotalevi, and I'm Program Coordinator of Legal Studies at Florida Gulf Coast University in Fort Myers, Florida. Copyright laws, again, on the forefront of education in cyberspace. The information superhighway certainly offers a variety of useful information. Much of it, though, is copyrighted material. There's been recent copyright legislation enacted, including the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, 
Act and Teach Act concerning web-based education. This work provides an overview of copyright law and addresses the new law as well as related issues. Hope it's helpful and you enjoy it. Let's have some fun too. Oh what a tangle Oh what a tangle web we weave. Sir Walter Scott once, Sir Walter Scott but once said, true. but you know it's true. Copyright law has been a hot topic of late and you got to be careful not to get ensnarled in the web. More evident than ever before the emergence of the internet as a teaching tool. You know the internet was once a research project by the army and even though Al Gore takes credit for it, it's the greatest computer system in the world. The net cyberspace and copyright law. There are many misconceptions about all of them. For example, many believe that one needs to provide some type of notice in order to possess a copyrighted work. Some think that registration is necessary or that photocopying requires express permission from the author in all cases. Also mistakes abound as to the defense of copyrights as well as thoughts of the dreaded copyright police coming to arrest someone for alleged infringement violations. You know folks, copyright law is simply misunderstood. How to be happy and safe in Cyberland? Oh sure, woohoo, I can use anything. It reminds me of that guy in one of the James Bond movies with Pierce Brosnan. He was a computer geek and he kept saying, I am invincible. Well, you're not. Uh, actually, there's no physicality to copyright. It's a protection, a type of intellectual property that uh, is an attachment of intangible rights. And it occurs when certain rules are followed. It's reminiscent of our federal or state constitutional protections. For example, even though a constitution could burn in a fire, we wouldn't lose our fundamental freedoms contained therein. What is copyright law? Well, there are numerous authors who have addressed the subject. The reason that copyright has been around for most of our country's existence is, well, because it has. In fact, the fundamental basis of copyright law stems from the United States Constitution. In Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, we find that the Founding Fathers wished to promote science and the useful arts by securing an exclusive right to writings. Section 106, though, of the Copyright Act of 1976 provides the basic framework for all our present statutes. It includes five exclusive rights, and they are as follows. Reproduction of the copyrighted work, preparation of derivative works, that's adaptations, based upon the copyrighted material, distribution of the work, performance of the work publicly, and the displaying of the work publicly. Copyright, though, remember, is a device. One must carefully examine several factors in order to determine whether or not something applies to copyright or that copyright law is applicable to it. And let's take a look at them. Go to the next slide. America's first copyright was signed by George Washington, the man on the $1 bill. Take a visit to this great website. Way back in 1790, he did that, and it appeared in the Columbian Centennial. Uh, Sentinel, excuse me. Uh, let's go over some of the uh, things that we cover in copyright law, some of the things that may be applicable to you. One thing is originality. That's a major requirement. The work must be independently conceived by its creator. There's a famous U.S. Supreme Court a case called Feist, and the court explained in this rather feisty decision, the primary objective of copyright law is, quote, not to reward the labor of authors, to, but to promote the progress of science and useful arts. The case involved the determination of lack of originality in print, uh, white phone directory pages to be uh, exact. Some things are copyrightable, but some things are just out there and not copyrightable. Another key factor is expression. All authors, including those online, must be aware that copyright law affords protection to expressions rather than ideas. Several works do not enjoy afforded protection in copyright, like titles, names, slogans, symbols, designs, uh, lettering, coloring, improvisational speeches, unrecorded performances, concepts, devices, systems, methods, calendars. Those things just simply aren't copyrightable. They may enjoy other protections like trademark and patent and the like. Many times there are other legal things that, that cover them. Example of copyrightable material include original, 
tangible forms of poetry, uh, literature, motion pictures, sound recordings, computer programming, music, plays, videos, photographs, drawings, and the like. One other thing that's required in copyright is something called fixation. It is so fixed when it is sufficiently permanent or stable to permit it to be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated for a period of more than a transitory duration. A work maybe could be sound, images, or both, just like we're doing right now, but it has to be fixed. Just about any form of original expression qualifies as a tangible medium, and this includes even RAM, computer random access memory, as well as notes hurriedly penned on the back of a table napkin. Please go to the next slide. So here again are our basic, so basic copyrights, right from the United States Code annotated, Title 17, Section 106. Remember, you have rights, and they are yours, but again, if it is a tangible, fixed medium that you're working with, and it's uh, something of originality, then those rights are going to apply. Ownership rights attach whenever one's expression is fixed in that tangible medium. It's often surprising to educators that no major protocol exists to obtain copyright protection. It's not necessary to put that little C uh, uh, in that little circular uh, device doohickey that <laughs> we used to see. Uh, it's okay if you don't have it. Now, it helps, especially if, uh, to put people on notice, but that was abolished years ago. Regarding the length of time that copyright protection lasts, uh, it, it used to run for an artist's lifetime plus 50 years. But in 1998, President Clinton signed the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, named after, yes, Sonny from Sonny and Cher, a measure extending the term an additional 20 years. And again, don't forget that usual C in the circular symbol or actual word copyright with the date and name of the owner. Let's look at defenses. There are defenses that one can bring up when one uses something that has been copyrighted. The works in the public domain. For example, tax returns. Oh my goodness, you actually photocopied a tax return and you actually used it and sent it to the IRS. The IRS copyright police, now you have two policemen coming after you. Uh -uh. Lenny's not going to come take you to jail and uh, there's no way that uh, Jack McCoy is going to have to be prosecuting you. The copyright may be expired or the holder may have forfeited his or her rights in the work. Remember Winnie the Pooh? Copyright expired. Now everybody uses Winnie the Pooh. So go ahead and use it if you want. Winnie the Pooh 101? Maybe a good course. The copyright holder may have granted permission. You can use my work. Well then how can you complain if you said I could use it and now I'm using it. No different than in a boxing match. Yes, I battered you to death. I did because you said and the ref said and the boxing commission said that I could beat up on you. Something called fair use. We're going to be taking a look at that in just a moment. Especially important to educators and the Teach Act. Go to the next slide. Fair use. Fair use. There are several defenses available for those who have allegedly violated copyright. And fair use is an exception to normal copyright legalities. It allows, in a limited manner, use of copyrighted protected materials in items for purposes of parody, news reports, comedic acts, research, education, hello. And there are basically four factors in determining whether or not it is applicable as a defense. Here they are from Title 17 of the U.S. Code, Section 107. We will be citing that statute a lot. 1. The purpose and character of the use, including whether use is of a commercial nature or for nonprofit educational purposes. By the way, do you like my graphic, fair use? It's not illegal to be corny. 2. The nature of the copyrighted work. What is it in essence? Three, the amount and substantiality of the portion used. How much did you use in relation to the work as a whole? And four, 
the effect and use upon the potential market for value. Now this is big. The market for it or the value of it, really big. If there's not much market for it, then the court is less likely to find a violation. But if I take the latest Harry Potter edition and reproduce the whole thing and put Bob Diotalevi on it, oh, we're going to have trouble, especially with number four. Fair use is uh, a case-by-case -case basis, by the way, so we let the courts determine it. Uh, the case of Campbell versus Acuff Rose Music demonstrates this. The court corrected two common lower court errors, and one was to treat the market effect factor as being the most important factor. The other was to give copyrighted work class treatment by holding, for example, that since the copying of the material from one book is an infringement, copying from all books is infringements. The court stressed that simple piracy is to be distinguished between uh, raising reasonable contentions of fair use. And the court reversed the sixth court regarding a group parodying Roy Orbison's Oh Pretty Woman in a song that uh, Mr. Campbell entitled Pretty Woman. After nearly a quarter of a million copies of the recording had been sold, Acuff Rose sued Two Life Crew and its recording company, Luke Skywalker Records. The court applied this four-factor test, and that's what they do. The problem with fair use is, though, that few courts have addressed it. There have been some cases, you can Google them, Basic Books Incorporated versus Kinko's and American Geophysical Union versus Texaco. Uh, these two cases came from the same federal district court with differing results regarding photocopy for education and personal uses. Please go to the next slide. Now we're going to talk about uh, something called the TEACH Act. Uh, before we do, though, I'd like to talk a little bit about something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And you can find uh, the DMCA in a variety of places. And by the way, before I go on, I'd like to mention something uh, first. So I'm going to interrupt my interruption. There are a lot of great, marvelous uh, copyright sites out there. And there are many of them excellent giving guidelines on fair use and, and going over the Teach Act, the DMCA, and they're based from schools. Google them. Stanford has a wonderful site. Uh, Yale, Princeton, most of the Ivy League schools, uh, Cornell. Visit them. They're really fabulous, and they have a, a lot of information, as I mentioned, I think that uh, you'll find most helpful. Now let's talk a little bit about the DMCA. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act was signed by President Clinton on October 28, 1998. It was a bill providing new game rules for the treatment and respect of online copyrighted material. And again, you can go online and you can Google them. Mr. Clinton said, quote, I am pleased that the Congress has passed the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This bill will implement two new landmark World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, treaties. These treaties provide clear international standards for intellectual property protection in the digital environment and protect U.S. copyrighted works, musical performances, and sound recordings from international piracy. Close quote. The 150-page document was divided by five tables. And basically, let me just give you a run-through as my busy friend here types. First of all, Title I was the implementation of those two treaties. Title II was a limitation on online infringement for ISPs. Of course, that's Internet Service Providers. It reduced legal uncertainties regarding such items as digital networks. It strengthened anti-online piracy policies. It outlined copyright owners' notification procedures. And it gave a safe harbor for four situations, conduits and system caching and uh, a, a couple of others which I'll skip here. But let, let me just go over basically. The DMCA limits copyright infringement liability for ISPs. That, that's really big, especially when they don't have any knowledge or they don't have any financial gain. We're an ISP and we have billions of people on our sites. Uh, what, what do we know what's going on? Why have us liable for something that a knucklehead did? And there are a lot out there. It makes a criminal a circumvention of anti-piracy devices. Those are called the little black boxes. It updates the library exemption for facilities like we have at our educational institutions to take full advantage of digital technology while engaging in activities similar to those for non-digital methodologies. It directs the Register of Copyrights to consult with educators, copyright owners, and libraries, and to submit recommendations. Yes, in distance education, you do have a voice. You have a say. 
It outlaws code cracking devices. Uh, it establishes guidelines and limits liabilities for institutions when faculty members use educational facilities in order to publish materials uh, online. So really, folks, go on and uh, Google the DMCA. You'll find a lot of great articles, some written by yours truly. I mean, those are the real terrific ones. Let's go on to the next slide. The TEACH Act. On November 2nd, 2002, this time President Bush signed into law the 21st Century Department of Justice Appropriations Authorization Act. That was H.R. 2215, which included something called the Technology, Education, and Copyright Harmonization TEACH Act of 2001, with technical amendments to the Copyright Act. On March 13th of 2001, the United States uh, Senate Judiciary Committee met to discuss the measure. And before you knew it, it got signed into law. President Bush again signing that. And the TEACH Act in depth goes into several things which we want to cover uh, in uh, this session. Number one, when digitizing analog works, the new law mandates that no digital version is available, if that is the case. And they must be free from uh, technology protections, no digital versions available. They're free from technological protections that will prevent their uses as authorized. So there's nothing wrong with using it this way. There's no digital version of it. We're not going to violate anybody's rights, and, and nobody's going to be uh, hurt by this. Then educator, educators rock on. Uh, you know, you, you can use stuff. Materials can be uploaded onto a server to be disseminated only, this is important, to students Number one, enrolled, number two, in a secure course, number three, in accordance with Section 110, which gives us our, our basic uh, uh, rights and duties here. So remember, this has to be reasonable. It has to be limited. We can't just put things up on the Internet, run hog wild, and invite Sister Susie and uh, Cousin Joe over and to look at it. This stuff that we're using is for teaching purposes, very much like fair use, and it has to be used in accordance with Section 110, disseminated only to students who are actually enrolled. Now, what the students do with it, well, that we can't uh, police. So if a student happens to download something, copy something, send it to somebody in an email, well, we're doing our best. How do we do our best? Make sure that we have copyright policies in effect. We'll talk about more uh, on those later. Number three, materials cannot be for the public. Well, that relates to up top, especially while the regular course is not in session. The stupidest thing we could do is have our person who's uh, dealing with our, our web materials or our webmaster leave the course up. Uh-oh. As educators, make sure that we have that stuff taken down. Make sure that we are policing our police people. Make sure that we have an understanding that that stuff comes down. And these things that we're utilizing in our teaching activities are taken care of properly. They should be made available again for what? Class time. When the class is in section, a session, only to students enrolled. And the class should be as secure as possible. Retention of the materials, number four, by the institution is permitted to the extent it's necessary for asynchronous instruction. So we're going to retain these things to sell them. No. We're going to retain these things to, uh, well, we're never going to use them again, but, you know, we, we're pack rats. We don't like to throw things away. You are asking for a lawsuit. You're asking for trouble. The Teach Act is great. It does bring into harmony uh, the analog and the digital, but be careful and do it right. Let's go on to the next slide. Let's look at a few more of these. Really not too tough, but uh, they are a little bit hairy, and we want to avoid liability. Let's move on. Number five. Number five. The Act amends Section 112 regarding ephemeral recordings. Those are copies that can be kept solely for transmission purposes. So again, what we want to do is we don't want to sell somebody else's recordings. We don't want to use anybody else's books uh, uh, in any inappropriate way. We want to use this stuff to transmit it to our students, to teach with it, and we don't want to violate copyright law. Number six, those involved must be educated. You mean the educators in an educational institution have to educate about being educated? Yeah. 
And as a result, we have to make sure that everybody involved knows about these policies. Hey, a great idea would be somebody like me, invite me down, pay me an exorbitant amount of money. No. But uh, get somebody in, get a lawyer, or get someone maybe who is familiar with copyright from your library to give the faculty, hey, be a great uh, faculty and service day, give the faculty some education about the TEACH Act and about other things. Okay, So that that way, when they are uh, in question about copyright law, they're not just going to go blanketly up there. And above all, the people, again, that need to know this are your web people, the folks that handle all of the putting up of your angel course and the like. Make sure they know about copyright law. Go on the web and, hey, you know something? You can, for educational teach fair use purposes, you may take one of my articles, and I have money, many, just, just Google them. You know, I've been paid millions to write these things. That's why I honestly should retire, but I don't know why I keep doing this. Yeah, I, I guess I just love it. But if you want to take one of my articles and you know print it up and make uh, photocopies for fair use purposes, not for money, because I don't get a cut of that, uh, then feel free to do so. You can disseminate it to your faculty. You can pass it out, uh, for example, to uh, your web people, and they can be uh, aware of these things. Also, you will look like a genius, and you will get a raise and make more money. The copyright expert now you are. Number seven, supervision, crucial, and policing by the school. Well, you said, Bob, there are no copyright police. Yeah, I know, but there are school police, and that should be you. You can now become the resident expert. Well, I don't want to be the resident expert. Well, fine, pass this information along to your superiors, and they will be very happy uh, that you did so. You have to supervise. You have to police your students, your courses, your faculty, your dean, yourself. It's crucial because we have to protect the rights of the copyright holder regarding performance or display at your school. Very important. Put signs up. You can buy these signs regarding copyright. This, this reminds me, folks, a lot of ADA issues, Americans with Disabilities Act. We have to instruct people on how to act, especially regarding our folks with disabilities, and we have to post warnings. This reminds me a lot of sexual harassment. It reminds me a lot of equal opportunity. You see those signs up there. Well, your institution should have them. You should have statements, and there are plenty out there on the Internet. You could write your own. Students, we don't violate copyright law. What I do in my courses is I post sites, websites to plagiarism, and I post websites to copyright, and I have quoted material with sources that they can look up so that the, when they violate copyright, and they will, when they plagiarize and they will, well, I didn't mean to do it. Meaning has nothing to do with it. You will violate. You can get the institution into trouble. Yourself in trouble, and the student can get into trouble. So be careful, okay? Number eight, the institution must provide notice that materials are or may be copyrighted, as well as informational materials concerning copyright. Well, that I kind of hinted at that just now. Make sure you tell your students, this stuff is copyrighted. Do you want to take the little C and put it in a circle? Copyright Robert Diotta Levy 2002? Great, that gives notice. You don't have to do that if you write things. Like, for example... This presentation that I'm giving you is copyrighted. You won't see anywhere a little C with the circle. and the, You won't, because I don't have to do that anymore. The Berne Convention and the like got rid of that, as we mentioned before. Okay, So just be careful. And by the way, this is Public Law 107-273-2002, as I mentioned, from President Bush and uh, Congress. You can Google it if you want the complete uh, uh, law. If you go on to any of my articles, by the way, you will see all of these citations, and so uh, that will give you some fire. You, uh, did it I don't hear sound anymore. Uh, I hope it's... Has it stopped for a second? I don't hear sound. Is it only me? Okay, it's back. Number five. The Act amends Section 112 regarding ephemeral recordings. Those are copies that can be kept solely for transmission purposes. So again, what we want to do is we don't want to sell somebody else's recordings. We don't want to use anybody else's books uh, uh, in any inappropriate way. We want to use this stuff to transmit it to our students, to teach with it, and we don't want it to violate copyright law. Number six, those involved must be educated. You mean the educators in an educational institution have to educate about being educated? Yeah. 
And as a result, we have to make sure that everybody involved knows about these policies. Hey, a great idea would be somebody like me, invite me down, pay me an exorbitant amount of money. No. But uh, get somebody in. Get a lawyer. or. Get someone maybe who is familiar with copyright from your library to give the faculty, hey, be a great uh, faculty in service day, give the faculty some education about the TEACH Act and about other things, okay? So that that way, let's move on. Let's move on. Now, five major changes assisting distance learning. Works now include limited and reasonable portions that are used to require that are used to require permission. So, an amount comparable to that typically displayed in a classroom. What that means is that if you could have used it in the classroom, woohoo, as Homer Simpson would say, you now can use it online in a transmission. The elimination of face to face. So, the things that weren't protected then are protected now digitally. Analog. All protected, whether you teach online or not. Copyrighted materials can be stored on a server for synchronous and asynchronous performances and displays, but be careful. Don't start passing it around to Aunt Nellie. Digitized versions of analog works can be made that are not available in digital format. We said that. Faculty, staff, and students are absolved of liability for temporary cash copies made in the digital process. Let's move. Okay, folks, we're going to talk a little bit of the do's and don'ts of this act. Do not digitize an entire literary dramatic work. That is stealing. And don't do it for a dramatic musical work. Don't retain digital copies past the class session. And, of course, if you're going to retain things, uh, you can make an argument that you're going to use it next semester. It's, it's already up for next semester, but you can't retain it if you're for 50 years. Do use reasonable and limited portions of audiovisual works. Do use reasonable and limited portions in the statutes. You can look those up as to what those are of dramatic musical works. Do not use an entire non-dramatic literary work. Do use an entire non-dramatic musical work. Confused? Good. Print this out. Keep it on your desk. Do use performances of any works that you would in the classroom and your face-to-face. And go to Ball State University. This will help you out. Let's go to the next slide. The U.S. Copyright Office has, the US Copyright Office has uh, information for you. There's the, the phones for in-person or publication uh, information. And you can contact the person and talk to them. And there's their website as well if you want to jot that down. Uh, there's their fax. I don't know why you would ever fax the copyright police except to say, I'm guilty, take me away. But uh, if you want to call them, ask questions and all, they have a marvelous website with a lot of free stuff. It's in the public domain. Woohoo! You can copyright it. Let's go to the next. Uh, you can copy it. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. Also, I get copyright updates. Also, I get copyright updates via email. Just send an email to their listserv at listserv at rs8.loc.gov and put in the body of the message and put in also the subject matter. Subscribe U.S. copyright. Put it in your title, put it in there, and make sure that they know, and you will get a nice little handy-dandy email that says, congratulations, you're one of us now, we are one. And so you'll be getting copyright updates. It's a nice little thing to have. Let's move on. Well, folks, it's been my pleasure to give you this presentation. I hope you did learn a little bit of uh, uh, information on copyright and our laws that apply there, too. There's my information. I'm from Florida Gulf Coast University, a great place to work, great place to be. If you ever come down, come and visit me. My email address is right there. It looks like Bob Diotta Levy, but my name is so long you cut the VI off. Okay, so it's B D I O T A L E at fgcu.edu. Drop me a line if you like this presentation. Great, go online, go on the World Wide Web and find some of my articles, and hopefully that'll help you there. The scales of justice are there to remind you: do not steal it, and make sure, above all things, have a great time teaching. Stay honest and copy it right. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Excuse me, are you ready? Okay, if you could just, excuse me. <coughs> okay.
weren't. While Bob is on his way, he had to take a plane because he couldn't walk from uh, Florida. If you could just add in the chat um, what you learned and if you have any questions, okay? And uh, support is trying to uh, fly the plane. Apparently, Bob is not answering his phone. Okay. So, uh, maybe he won't be able to come in after all these years. I can't believe it. We've had Bob for years. And uh, WizIQ has improved so much over the years. So, oh, I see Bob. Bob is here. Okay. We got you. Wow. Wow, I can breathe again. I was just telling my husband that this year there aren't any problems. And there aren't, because I see Bob is with us. Yay! All right, so uh, let's uh, hope that that's initializing. And um, okay, support. Uh, it looks like uh, Bob is not answering the phone because he's right here with us. Okay, so this is Nelly. As I said, I'm moonlighting for Bob. Don't tell anybody. But he doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be going through. Uh, Bob, could you uh, just respond in the chat? I know you said you're not seeing anything, but uh, we're seeing you for some reason, even though you're not seeing us. And uh, so can you uh, write in the chat box? Let's see. Um, I see it has a video too this time. He's using a Mac, the same Mac that I'm using actually. So if I'm not having any problems, I don't know why anybody else should be having problems. All right, so uh, let's see if we can uh, get that going. Let's see uh, if was IQ support, can you uh, do some magic? and make things happen for us. Okay, so let's see if there are any questions. Um, sound is okay, I see. We can manage without the video. Okay, that's a true, uh, that's true. Let's try if we can get um, audio to work here. Okay, so let me just give you uh, audio and let's see if that works. Uh, maybe you won't see anything, but at least uh, we'll be able to uh, get your voice. The question is whether you can accept a mic if you don't see it coming. I'm not sure about that. Okay, there are three questions here by Haley. Um, and there is a question there by Tom. But for some reason, maybe, um, maybe Bob should just refresh his page. Let me just get that to him. I don't know if you can hear me or not, uh, but let me uh, just tell him to refresh. I see you in class. Could you refresh the page? Okay, let's see if that can get to him. You lost your voice. <laughs> You're in good company. A lot of people have laryngitis these days because of colds. Yeah, I like that question too. It always, um, let's see if we can get, um, I don't know why I have, <laughs> okay, was IQ support. Okay, let's try again. All right, we've got support here, but I think we're doing fine. But our presenter can't come in, so can, um, yeah, it says Bob is online, I know, but Bob sent me an email saying that he can't see. He can't see anything. He's in here, but he's not able to see. So, um, I don't know. I don't understand what's going on. But I'll tell you a story, though. A really strange story. I called it the ghost 
or I called it out of the out of the classroom experience, like you have out of the body experience. Oh, I hear I you, Bob. Yes, Bob. So good. Now, yes, finally. And you hear yes, me? Yes, we we see you. Hi, Hi. there's a hug. Hi, there's Emily. a hug. You look Hi. great. Oh, awesome. Hi. I'm so happy Hi. to see you. You have no idea. This and we can finally see you. Well, well I said your flu from I said we couldn't walk from Florida, so you had to fly, you know, on this magic carpet. All right, so you're here with us. That's the main thing. All right. And Nelly, can you hear me? Yes. And Nelly, it's the can you hear me? It's the first time ever. Can you hear me? I've ever it's the first time ever, folks, that uh, I've ever presented here in living color, too. Normally, we do this just by mic, but I'm on my Mac. So sorry that this took so long. Uh, but for some odd reason, we had technical difficulties. I've been doing this with Nelly now, my goodness. Uh, uh, she and I were just children when we started. This has been about seven or eight years. And so I'd like to take some questions and the like. But, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it's a little bit uh, uh, difficult uh, here, kind of coming at the last minute, but we're going to try our best. So um, I'm trying to take a look here, Nelly, at the questions that we've had. And I'm not sure. I think by checking back in again, I think I've lost just about everything that I had uh, before. So I think I've lost some of the questions. So if you would mind, uh, you know, typing them again, uh, I'd appreciate it. Let me just go over some basic stuff. I know the PowerPoint's a little bit uh, fast, and it's because we have limited time. I try to get into a lot of stuff. Nellie normally posts it on her website. It's been posted. If you Google it, uh, you'll find it. Thank you, Nellie. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. I hope you've gotten something out of it. I tried to teach you basically copyright law uh, maybe about uh, two months worth in, you know, like 25 minutes. So I know that's difficult. It's kind of like, you know, do-it-yourself brain surgery. But it's always a pleasure to be here with Nellie and you folks. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions. And uh, I know that some of you, where you, where you are, it's uh, cold. Uh, I'm sorry, but from Dunk City here, if you're a basketball fan, uh, college-wise, you know where Dunk City is. We have a, a very miserable 83 degrees here completely sunny and it's been like that for weeks. Let me go through a little bit of, of the TEACH Act and uh, just to reiterate uh, a few things as I mentioned. Uh, the TEACH Act, again, uh, someone asked me, I noticed one question before I lost power here, Scotty, we need more power, uh, is it international? Again, that goes to the Byrne Act and what the Byrne Act is all about it was uh, passed back in the day in the Clinton administration to cover situations where we have international treaties. That doesn't mean that everything is completely covered. So the TEACH Act, you'd have to go country by country. Sorry, that that's the quick and dirty answer. Would the TEACH Act be recognized in Yugoslavia? Can't help you there. It, it's American-based. Now, the TEACH Act, again, is distance education-based, and it kind of removes the concept of the physical classroom. However, I want you to be very, very um, uh, careful uh, regarding the TEACH Act. Now, is contact on the internet copyrighted? Yes. And you don't need, again, the little C in the circle. Everything on the internet, including everything on the World Wide Web, is copyrighted. Let me tell you a quick story. And it has to do with linking to something on the, the web. Is linking, mere linkage, a violation of copyright? And the answer is no. A hyperlink from one web page to the is not a copyright violation. But here's the story. Get permission always if you can. In California, several years ago, there was a person who was a faculty member. This faculty member decided to take three links in succession, ABC, from a course that they came up with. Now, it was their course, they decided to leave, and they took these three links in succession. They came up with their own course at another school. The first school where they developed this uh, course sued them. And again, Bob just said, it's taking something, uh, a hyperlink from, uh, you know, it's, it's on the web, can't you do it? Those three links in succession were unique to the course of the first school where they developed it. So the court ruled it was a copyright violation. So I guess that says uh, don't take links in succession. If you're going to come up with a course, you can take links, but make the course different. Okay, uh, Nellie has put up a whiteboard for me. Thank you so much, Nellie. Why do people take uh, videos of movies, and isn't that also copyright? Yes and no, and we're going to do some uh, hypotheticals under the TEACH Act, and that's going to clear that up. 
links to materials isn't a violation by the presenter. Don't understand what you mean by that. In other words, if I use my materials or if you use these materials, again, that uh, PowerPoint that I gave you is copyrighted. So you should have permission. We talked about the international stuff. Thank you, Nellie. Let me give you some uh, fact patterns, and we'll take a look at it, okay? And, and you can vote on these, which is what usually I do with Nellie here. And she always fails them. I don't know. This is like your 10th time, Nellie. Come on. You're embarrassing me. Okay. Here are some teach act scenarios I'm going to read to you. And we'll take a vote if you want to vote here uh, on our website. Great. You don't have to. Uh, you can say yes or no. You can keep it to yourself. But let me look at some of these video issues that you all deal with and that I deal with every day and see if we have copyright violations. Okay, here's the first scenario. KCPT is a public television station in Kansas City, Missouri, which offers distance learning programs just like we do here, and I'm sure you do too. The station has a written copyright policy, SMART, and televises programs regarding U.S. copyright law to educate its viewers. In addition to using four-way uh, full motion pictures to broadcast class sessions, the station also uses Blackboard. I use it, some of you use it, to distribute course content to students enrolled in online courses. A statement appears on the online courses homepage regarding the presence of copyrighted materials, and they have that on their website. The station restricts the transmission of copyrighted materials to students who officially enroll in the course. Now, I mean, come on, what more can you do, right? These people are saints at KCPT. Here's the question. And if you want to vote, please do so. You can say yes or no and punch me a message. Is it legal, according to copyright law, for KCPT to use copyrighted materials in its distance learning programs according to the Teach Act? Are they doing it right? From what you know, from what you've seen from my PowerPoint, from what you've known in your, in your dealings, are they okay? What do we think? Take a minute and think about it. What do we think? Take a minute and think about it. Remember, the Teach Act removes the concept of a physical Remember, the Teach Act removes the concept of a physical classroom. It allows storage of copyrighted materials on its servers. What do we think? But are they okay by the Teach Act? What do we think? Take a second to think about it. Uh, Amina says, are they making good money? <laughs> uh, some, uh, Amina says, are they making good money? <laughs> Is it just for educational purposes? Uh, it's a public television station, so they're nonprofit. Um, okay, folks are coming in. We got Haley and Janet. That's my wife's name. Um, okay, folks are coming in. We got Haley and Janet. That's my wife's name. Most people saying okay. Let me give you the answer. Some people saying no. Let me give you the answer. Because a public television station, even a public one, does not meet the requirements of an accredited nonprofit educational institution, the Teach Act only applies to teaching at qualified institutions. KC, KCPT would not be allowed to use the material. What threw you is the public television not making any money. Again, the TEACH Act only is for um, limited to students enrolled in courses at um, educational institutions that meet the requirements. Okay, let me give you another scenario here. I, I like these scenarios because just like in class, so you use them as well, they kind of help folks understand. Let's get back into the classroom. An advanced placement African American history class in a high school is available to students online. They have an online password protected blackboard environment. The teacher, Mrs. Main, wants to set the stage for the environment in Germany prior to World War II. Mrs. Main owns a videotape of Swing Kids, a movie depicting the lives of young adults prior to World War II. She places the instructional media staff to dig she asks the instructional media staff to digitize a 10 minute clip of swing kids and then places it in her blackboard course. Does Mrs. Main qualify to do this under the Teach Act? Yes, somebody's mentioning Winnie the Pooh. Yes, Winnie the Pooh, the copyright is gone. Yes, somebody's mentioning Winnie the Pooh. Yes, Winnie the Pooh, the copyright is gone. Everybody owns Winnie the Pooh. In, in fact, next year, Nellie's gonna call this C O fifteen Winnie the Pooh, and she'll be all right. School. Take a, a minute to think about that. It's a high school. It's an online password protected class. She wants to take 10 minutes of it, digitize it, put it on her class. On her Blackboard course, can she do this? Take a minute to think. Do you want to vote? Go ahead. Take a take a minute to think. Do you want to vote? Go ahead. 
key to this one is password protected. The key to this one is yes. password protected. The Teach Act yes, the is the answer. According to the Teach Act, an instructor can use a reasonable and limited portion. Now, I know what you're all saying. Bob, what is a reasonable and limited portion? All right. In one of my slides on the PowerPoint, I detailed in a couple, uh, one or two slides, what is reasonable. What's reasonable for a film? What's reasonable for a book? The bottom line is, as long as it's password protected, and here, it's a dramatic performance. I get dramatic versus non-dramatic. I mean, the rules are ridiculous, but they're they're learnable. Just take a look at them. You're going to be okay. So I can't learn all these rules. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Take my PowerPoint and that slide or two that, that goes through that, or some of the websites that I've given you in my lecture, in my PowerPoint, um, in my um, uh, materials that I, I print, okay, that I, I've uh, uh, um, published, rather. So now, she has this 10 minutes. Assuming that no DVD of the film's available, a portion can be uploaded into the course. However, the clip must be formatted as streaming audio to prevent copying and distribution. So in other words, copy it right, do it right. Show it, yes, but make sure it's password protected. We're seeing a pattern here, and the pattern is very easy. When it's a non-accredited, non-qualifying uh, institution, when it's a public broadcasting uh, service, so when, it's, when it's a station like that, no, it has to be for teaching. Think of the Teach Act. Can I take the whole thing and start selling it and giving it to everybody on the Internet? No. If I put portions of it that are according to the Teach Act, again, look at my PowerPoint, look at the law. There are plenty of resources out there. University of Texas is a great one. There are others. They take you through the Teach Act word for word and summarize it, as my PowerPoint does, I hope, too. If it's in the teaching realm, if you're using it, the transmissions, an accredited nonprofit educational institution, not a nonprofit public television station, you're going to be okay. If it's limited to students in the course through password protection. Now, wait a minute, you say, Bob, what if they take it? Well, then they're violating copyright law, and they download it, and they sell it. Well, they're violating copyright law. You're not. Let me give you some tips as we go along here. Know your institutional copyright policies. My institution doesn't have one. Great. Start a committee. You'll get promoted. You'll be the copyright expert. Go to your dean. Go to your chair and say, you know something? We need to have a policy on this. Great. That's more work for me. I know, but it won't take long, especially when you start uh, looking through this. You don't have to be an attorney. Provide copyright training to your educational technologists, to your staff, to your faculty. Some of you out there are deans. Some of you out there are chairs. Get that going. Have seminars. Invite me. I don't charge much. Well, I do because it takes me a lot to get you know, me out of Florida. Have something online like Nellie's doing here. I mean, you've got free resources right here to do it, right? So you can find others, and you can have somebody come in like me or someone else in your faculty, or you can do it to educate people. Because people are violating copyright every day. They're going to get into legal trouble. There's no copyright police again, but there's lawsuits out there. Trust me, I'm a lawyer. Train your faculty. Have a model copyright compliance for students. Have it posted. The federal government will send you some for nothing. Uh, you, you see them all over the internet. You can get copies. You can get samples. Post them. Put them in your courses. Come up with a cut and paste. And if you want, you know, give credit to where credits due, unless the federal government. That's public domain, and that's free, and that's where you don't have to give copyright credit. And put it up there. This is my copyright policy for this course. This is our copyright policy according to X Y Z institution. Have copyright guidelines. Keep up with changing institutional um, uh, policies and changing laws. And again, uh, one of my favorite uh, sites is University of Texas. If you Google University of Texas, U Texas copyright, they have a wonderful site. If you go on and Google Robert Yadalevi copyright article, you'll find dozens of copyright articles that I've written. Nelly puts this up for us as well, so you can watch this PowerPoint again. It, it, it's online. There are things out there. Now look, folks, I'm an attorney, as you know. I'm uh, licensed in two states. I didn't do that overnight. So don't let this overwhelm you. Don't treat this like it's your first week of law school. Oh my goodness, it's too much. I'll never be able to handle it all. Well, take your time then. Start reading up on it. Read my articles. Email me if you need something. Okay. Okay. Let's take a look at a couple more of these. I think I think they'll help you out. An instructor for an online geography course using WebCT 
is covering the topic of volcanoes and wants to digitize a full 30-minute NOVA program. Bells and whistles. Now my law students here should be going off. Good. Don't jump to conclusions. You can't do that. What the full NOVA? Wait a minute. Always handle each piece at a time. It's entitled Volcanoes Deadly Warning. They can't do that. Wait a minute. The program was recorded off the local PBS affiliate the week before on VHS, and he wants to make a real media streaming file of this film uh, to give to his students. More information on volcanoes and signals. No DVD of the NOVA program exists. Can he do that under the Teach Act? What do we think? Take a minute to think about it. The one thing in law we do is not jump to conclusions. Bruce says, yes, it's a protected site. Answer a reasonable portion. Well, that's my question, Bruce. Is a 30-minute full NOVA program reasonable? He wants to show the whole thing. And he, he, it's an online course, again, using WebCT. He wants to digitize it. Bruce says, yeah, no, it shouldn't be too bad. It's a protected site. Let me drop down here. <laughs> Reminds me of a case study in law school. <laughs> it's his, yeah, he, he, he got it off the TV. It's his, yeah, he, he, he got it off the TV. But then again, can I just go on TV and, you know, tape Law and Order and show the whole show? Here's the answer. Okay, here's the answer. The answer is a tricky one because it sounds like he's just violating so much stuff. The answer is yes. First, the videotape had been obtained legally. PBS, many of you know this, will allow you. You'll see. You may have a copy of this for, for teaching purposes. You may record this because they know people are going to anyway. Okay? So he's okay. Secondly, here's the big key. There's no DVD available to the program. They don't sell it. They don't make money off it. You're not violating anybody's money-making rights. So make it okay to digitize the video. Finally, it's a documentary. It's non-dramatic. Oh, here we go again. I didn't memorize these rules. Go to the PowerPoint. Yeah, but this is a lot of confusion. No, look at my PowerPoint. Look at the University of Texas. Ah, let me see what that says. Non-dramatic, a full tape can be digitized. Yeah, but I thought it was 10 minutes. No, no, that, that's dramatic. See, all these little pit, pit snicky rules here, but if you just look at them, sit down with them, go piece by piece, inch by inch, as to what you can do, you're going to become the copyright genius uh, of, of your um, uh, school. Okay. All right. And I know we just have a few more. We're kind of wrapping up here, um, and I know we just have a few more moments here. And again, I'm so sorry. Normally, this works like clockwork. Uh, normally, I get on. I don't know what happened. Uh, we just had so many snafus. I watched the video with you folks, and then I come right on. So we kind of ran out uh, the last 10 minutes. But I want to just go over the last few moments. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to help you. I just want to go through just a couple of things about uh, this, this presentation. I've been doing it with Nellie now, as I said, more years than I can remember. Nellie and I were babes when we started here. I try to do this at least every year or two. So if you didn't get the full gist of it, probably another six months or a year, uh, Nellie and her good graces maybe will have me back, which I appreciate. I love doing this because really so many people do not understand copyright law at all. And you might be saying to yourself, well, Bob, that's me. It isn't because you picked up so much in just this one uh, half hour, hour here that the, uh, you've been listening to, to me uh, last actually about 50 minutes or so. And the thing is, you now have the key to lawyer's knowledge. I'm not saying you're a lawyer, you're going to become one, you don't want to become one, I don't blame you, I became one. What you have here, folks, is you have the ability to find, and that's exactly what we lawyers do. When you go to a law office, you say, I have this problem. And what does the lawyer always say? Let me get back to you tomorrow. Let me get back to you next week. And they have their paralegals do the research, or they do the research. The thing is, the key is that that's now what you're empowered to do. You have my PowerPoint. You have me. If, if you need anything, I'd be happy to help. You have University of Texas and other things out there, other resources. My articles are, uh, just Google them again. I've written articles the past dozen years on copyright. You print that stuff out. I'm giving you permission to print it out and use it uh, uh, as your resource, but not to use it as yours. That's a big difference, okay? And you know on the internet, you know, you can you can download articles and look at them and the like. But the key to all this is when you start studying it, when you start putting all this stuff together, my PowerPoints and articles and other people's works on it, it's really not that hard. The bottom line, what I want to leave you with, the most important thing is 
Ask permission always if you don't know. That's the best thing in the world. Can I use this stuff? Ask permission. That's the number one number uh, one thing I can tell you, numero uno, if you prefer, is that if you ask permission, if you don't jump, if you look at the teach law and you don't panic, you get through it as best you can, you read it, and it is good reading. That's why we lawyers stay up nights racking our brains and you know, taking out our hair uh, doing it. But it's not as hard as you think. Seek out help. Look at it. Take your time on it. The number one thing I want to leave you with is have a copyright policy again. I, I can't stress that enough. Please have a copyright policy. Get one online. Go to your boss. Tell him you need it. Put it on your courses that this stuff is copyrighted. And if you steal anything from it, folks, it's not my fault. It's yours. That will protect you, I hope, as best can from any personal liability and liability uh, to your institution. It's been a pleasure, as always. I look forward to coming back, Nellie. I'm going to turn it back over to Nellie. And thank you so much for being here. If you need anything, you got my email. Thank you. Please contact Bob, me. our thank time you. is really up because we have Jason next. And we're going to have raps. So, Bob, if you're in the mood for some raps by Jason R. Levine, join us at the next session. Uh, take a look at the chat box. Yeah. So, oh, you're starving. I'm starving. I want to wrap. So, wrap and eat. Hey, what's going on? I see Jason is uh, on, and 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 I gotta get out. Okay. So, uh, Bob, let's go into the next session. Thank you, everyone. Join us, and see you next year or sooner. Bye. Thank you.